Salente, the director of the Trends Research Institute, home of the Trends Journal, with hard-hitting, in-depth analysis of the economic, socio-political, and cultural trends. Welcome back, Gerald Salente. Oh, thanks for having me, Chris. You know, according to our uh, official numbers, the economy is rolling along normally, full recovery. Your team, though, according to this latest must-read Trends Journal, is nonplussed by all this talk. I mean, you point out that growth is sluggish and millions of high-paying jobs have been shipped offshore. You've even coined a term, the grand manipulation. You call it a new primary trend impacting every level of every American that's sapping our purchasing power, making employment opportunities scarce. You know, the majority of us are just trying to make ends meet. Can you tell us more about the grand manipulation, please? Yes, actually, and that piece is being written or has been written by Dr. Paul Craig Roberts, who, of course, is the former assistant treasury secretary under Ronald Reagan. And many people know who he is. To me, he's one, when I look for geopolitical or economic insights, there's no one that I trust or admire more than him. And the grand manipulation is that the whole system is manipulated. And this is in the conspiracy theory. I mean, we could start with the Forex markets, 5.3 trillion traded a day. Probably now with these currency uh, swings going on much higher than that, probably more like 6 trillion a day. And we know that they were rigged. It's not in a conspiracy. They caught the people. But, of course, in the grand manipulation, only we, the little people, go to jail and pay, you know, pay with our lives. They get a slap on their wrist. Their companies pay a fine. And then they go on to do the next dirty deal. Like, how about rigging the LIBOR rates? Oh, the LIBOR rates? Yeah, the interest rates. Oh, we know they rigged them. They got caught. Well, nobody went to jail. Well, you're not supposed to go to jail. It's the grand manipulation. They manipulate the markets. They manipulate the news. They manipulate the geopolitical news. Have you heard enough fear and propaganda, fear and hysteria for one day? If you haven't, I can make some up. The ISIS is coming. Watch out. Hey, we got this guy over there in Ohio. He had a gun, and he was going to go into Washington, D.C., and he would have destroyed the whole joint. Hey, wait a minute. He got one guy in a country of $320 million? Just driving our car to the local grocery store or commuting to and from work, you're infinitely more likely to injure yourself or be injured than by any of these things that we're spending billions of dollars on. Could turn that on its head and say, well, we haven't had any major tragedy since 9-11. They're not correlated because they're, all the proof is there in front of everybody with the CIA records and the NSA records. The torture did not bring any results. That's a fact according to what's been released. And the NSA hasn't found anybody. And they're spending, what, $60 billion a year listening to him, watching everything that we're doing. This is supposed to be America, the land of the free. And every one of the founding fathers warned us against this. So the grand manipulation goes in many different varieties, and, 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 it, and it controls us in many different ways. You know, we just had a over here in New York, the snowstorm is coming. The snowstorm is coming. This mayor closed down the city. He told people not to go on the sidewalks and to get off the streets. And you get a three hundred dollar fine if you're caught driving your car. I mean, I've been around all my life. This never happened before. Uh, you all talk about quantitative easing, power shift, if you will, behind the scenes directly to what you call mega banks. And it leaves ample room, you say, for this reckless speculation that continues to push up certain sectors at the expense of others. Any comments in there? Four words killed capitalism. This is not a capitalistic society. Too big to fail. In capitalism, there's no such thing. And those too big to fail banks have not gotten 40% bigger, and they're controlling most of the action. And then you look at the people. It's, it's not a revolving door going around Washington. It's one door, and they're it. The banks are in charge. And that's what's going on. So when we're looking at the facts, here's the deal. I'm going to play Federal Reserve, and you play one of the big banks. And I say to you, listen, here's the deal. I'm going to loan you money at 0.25%. You're a good guy. Loan out the money. Get everything you want for it. 
In the meantime, you start loaning it out to these big corporations, and they're buying back all the, they're buying back stock. That accounts for over fifty percent of the increase in the equity markets. And then you loan it to the hedge funds, the private equity groups, the venture capitalists, which are gamblers, and all of them, and they make dough on it too. Because you're loaning it to them for nothing, and they're doing I mean, mergers and acquisition deals. They're doing speculation. Merger and acquisitions in 2014 were back to 2007 levels. Let's put the facts in place. Since quantitative easing began, the equity markets went from 8,000 to 18,000. Go to Japan, Abenomics. That's how you say quantitative easing in Japanese. It went from a 57 percent gain in the equity markets. Look what happened over in Europe. For months, Mario Draghi, the head of the European Central Bank, former uh, managing director of the European Division of Goldman Sachs, what did he do? He'd been saying, you know, we're going to do anything we need to do. And they did. They announced that they're going to do quantitative easing at a tune of about 60 billion euros a month, a total of 1.3 trillion through September 2016. Now, look at the equity markets. In anticipation of what he was going to do, they went up to seven-year highs in Europe. The only people that have benefited from this, and this isn't, you know, this isn't speculation; it's a fact. Are that not the one percent, the zero, the point zero one percent, according to Oxfam, eighty five people will have more wealth than ninety nine percent of the rest of the population in twenty sixteen. When you talk about wealth disparity, it just harkens back to the first point you made, that the money that was supposed to be lent out, given to the major banks by our government, it was supposed to be lent out to the mom and the pops, the everyday folks, so that they could buy a home, so that they could start a business. Remember that used to be the backbone of our economy, mom and pop businesses, the self-employed? It didn't used to be a curse word, you know, a negative moniker. Now it is, and that's where the money normally would have gone, but it's not where it went. And as you said, the banks lent it to the major institutions. The major institutions bought back their stock. It causes an artificial increase in demand because there's fewer shares outstanding. And as Gerald Salente just pointed out aptly, that could be 50% of what was responsible for the increase in the stock market. So it makes corporate America feel and look dynamic and wealthy, but it really leaves Main Street in the cold, doesn't it? The, the facts speak for themselves. I mentioned the Oxfam study. They just came out with a Pew Research Center study about a month ago that's showing that the gap between the rich and the poor in the United States is in worse shape than it was during the Gilded Age. People could look these up. They're, they're there for everyone to look up. And then you look at the numbers going on. We're, we're, we're looking at median household income below 1999 levels. Well, look what happened with December retail sales. They were down 0.09%. They were supposed to go up. What they're saying, I want to make this very clear. They've come up with a big lie. Ever since I went to college, my first year in college was 1965, and having Economics 101, they taught us how bad inflation was and how it hurt people's spending power. And then all of a sudden, they made up a new one. Deflation is bad. Now, I'm not making this up. Now, remember, all my life, I never heard this up until last year. I never, ever heard this, that deflation was bad, and here's the reason why the white shoe boys on Wall Street and over to Europe, the city, the city of London, this is the lie that they've come up with. We have to stop this deflationary cycle, and here's why, Chris, because consumers know that prices are going to go down. And if they know prices are going to go down, they're not going to buy things. And that's going to hurt. Pound the butt is going to go down to, what, three cents and you're waiting for it to happen. That's not why you're buying it. People aren't buying things because they don't have any money. That is pervasive. I mean, it's ubiquitous. We're all... 
It's the manipulation. That's what I'm trying to say. They're manipulating the story. They're, it's not deflation. Could any adult have the courage to say depression? That's why prices keep crashing down like we're seeing with oil prices, like you're seeing with iron ore, like you're seeing with copper. And so how do they get away with it? I mean, how is it that this grand manipulation, how is it that this deception, almost like a great veil uh, thrown over all of our eyes collectively, and it's it's really pretty simple. Firstly, we've got these nice, innocuous fail-safes put in place over many decades, and one of them, of course, is the um, debit cards, which is essentially food stamps. That's the fail-safe. That's the safety net. So it gives us the illusion, well, there's nobody out in the streets panhandling. We don't see lines. Lines of people wrapped around city blocks don't see what we saw back in the 1930s, the Depression. But maybe we don't see it because of those systems. 50 million people almost require those food stamps, those debit cards, just to make ends meet and put a dinner on the table. If that system suddenly imploded, we might have a similar situation as the Depression. And my guess is you probably would say worse. Yeah, and you look at the numbers. What, they came out with another study that half the children in public school... That are homeless, that are living either with their parents in cars or under bridges right now. That's part of it. That's part of it. The other part is half of them are li living at or below the poverty line. Uh, that's new to me. I have not read that. I, I, I knew it was high. It was 30 to 40 percent. That's how bad things are. So this is a depression. It's global. And they're hiding it because what you have is you have a society, for example, of America, 320 million people. So if you know 150 million are doing okay, another bunch of over there and over here, and like you said, you know the food stamps keep the bread lines away. It's bifurcated, isn't it? It's it's really almost a tale of two economies. I mean, how do you break through? You know, I mean, as that power starts to culminate in one side or the other and your your society really is split apart like a log. If, if we use history as a guide, it leads, I would say, to um, dictators and, and just all kinds. Dictate. We have dictators. We have a, we are at war now with Syria without Congress having declared it. We have dictators. We have this one, the one before him, the one before that one. They do what they want. And here's the deal. Nothing is going to change. People prefer to call them Republicans and Democrats. How much more money do they have to steal from us in the name of too big to fail, tax breaks and loan guarantees, and other special deals for their pals? How long is it going to take us to call them murderers? How many more people do they have to kill in foreign countries under the name of spreading freedom and democracy? A million in Iraq based on a war that was not true, that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction and ties to al-Qaeda. A million dead isn't enough? How about Afghanistan? Oh, yeah, we got to get there because they got the Osama bin Laden's hiding there. Yo, oh, yeah, and how did the Taliban, who they come out there? Well, we were the, oh, they were the Mujahideen before that, weren't they? Yeah. And who, who created them? Oh, wasn't that Jimmy Carter and, uh, and, and Reagan to overthrow the Russians in their battle against the uh, Afghans when the Russians were fighting them in, in, in Afghanistan? Yeah, but that's old history. That doesn't count. Hey, what about, how about Libya? Great job. Hey, it's, matter of fact, I was thinking of vacationing in Tripoli there because everything is so nice now without Gaddafi there. The place is in civil war. The joint's blowing up. Oh, under the auspices that they was going to help the people. Can you imagine the pressure that the standing leader in the Oval Office must feel from the um, powers that be? No man, no woman would feel pressure from powers to be. Could you imagine Washington feeling pressure? Shift the discussion back to the economy and, and get an idea of uh, what you think about the EU. You know, the European Union is, it looks like, at least on the periphery, it's starting to unravel a bit and uh, we're seeing some cracks in the foundation, particularly with regard to, you know, this big sea change event, Greece, and also with Switzerland kind of throwing a curveball there at the last moment, unexpected by anyone, as you mentioned earlier, causing massive currency turmoil. My brokerage 
brokerage, FXCM, Forex brokerage, acquired a bailout. You know, these types of things don't inspire confidence, do they, in the financial markets? No. And again, the only people that they're helping, you look at the numbers, are the, are the high rollers and the big players. Everybody else has been frozen out. We've gone over all the numbers. The numbers don't lie. Man. Sir, we need to break up this one-party system, the two-headed one-party system. That's what happened in Greece. That's what's going on in Spain. It's happening in Italy. It's been instilled, you know, infused into the very framework of our country now for so long, has it not? Can you think of a time when a third party actually had a chance? It had a chance in 1992, and I know it well, uh, when Ross Perot ran. And he got 19% of the vote, and he was out of his mind in, in so many areas. For example, he was in the race, out of the race, in the race, out of the race. And he sure had that NAFTA right, though, didn't he? He nailed that on the head. I mean, he said it's a giant sucking sound. It's pulled a good 10 million high-paying jobs from our manufacturing sector. Yep. So I think that was a good opportunity. I think it's even better now. I don't think, and look, they just had a midterm election. 74% of the people stayed home. If we could get the money, money, power, and interest out of that electoral process, then maybe we could have a free political system. What do you think? Part of it, yeah, but it's, it's, you know, they're too entrenched. We need, we need an alternative. You know, it's just more of the same. Every election we get to vote for a lesser of two evils. Again, I want to see a third party. I've had enough of them. Again, by the DG shall know them. They start wars, they kill people, and they steal our money. I had enough of them. That was never part of our Constitution. They've taken our Bill, our bill of Rights away from us. They're, they've destroyed the Constitution. Again, to me, the, the way is the third party. And if I was to forecast a trend for 2016, I think that's it. We're just going to see a grassroots uprising of a Ron Paul-like leader who's just going to inspire confidence in take all the people who are sitting on the couches saying, I've given up, I toss up my hands, I can't take any more of this. You know, you're my guy. I vote you as the uh, vice president. We'll have a new office, the secretary of trends. All right, well, Gerald Salente, we always appreciate your thoughts. And uh, any parting comments? Yeah, we have a lot of a lot of the trends that are happening now are in our trends journal. We also have a, the trends conference. We have five and a half hour conference that people could log on and, and purchase as well. Uh, everything that we've said in that conference is happening in front of us. These are very volatile times. The markets have been swaying and swooning since the beginning of the new year. I've never seen a start like this one in my life. And uh, so we're urging people to you know, read history before it happens. Be prepared. Take advantage of the opportunities. Avoid the dangers. And we do our very best to provide it in the Trends Journal. And we're going to look forward to having you back on the show with us, sir. Thanks so much for having me on. All the best. Thank you so much. 